Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be on righteousness, and our opening text will be Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So let's define some words. Let's go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. The more I read this, the more respect I have for the man. Righteousness, noun. Purity of heart. Conformity of heart and life to the divine law. Righteousness as used in scripture and theology in which it is chiefly used is nearly equivalent to holiness. Ah, nearly equivalent to holiness. Comprehending holy principles and affections of heart and conformity of life to the divine law. It includes all we call justice, honesty, and virtue. With holy affections, in short, it is true religion. As applied to God, the perfection or holiness of his nature, faithfulness. Three, the active and passive obedience of Christ by which the law of God is fulfilled. Daniel 7, 9, 7. Daniel 9, 7. Justice Equity between man and man, Luke chapter 1 and verse 75. The cause of our justification. The Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23 and verse 6. All right, well, let's take a look at reproach. Verb, transitive, to censure in terms of contempt, to charge with a fault in severe language, uh, to suggest or blame for anything. To treat with scorn or contempt. Reproach as a noun. Censure, mingled with contempt or derision. Um, shame, infamy, disgrace. Uh, let's see. In Bible usage, give not thine heritage to reproach. Now remember, a man's heritage is his children. Uh, he takes a look at Joel 2.17 and Isaiah 4.1. Uh, an object of contempt, scorn, or derision. And then he uses it in a sentence. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we may be no more a reproach Nehemiah 2.17, that which is the cause of shame or disgrace, Genesis 30 and verse 23. So let's read that again. Righteousness exalteth a nation, a group of people, right? But sin is a reproach to any people. You know, there is a reason why the those that are Lord called the children of the devil 
why they wish to lead us into sin. Because they know full well that the Lord will punish and possibly destroy us when things get bad enough. I mean, look at how things were. Let's say, I, now I'm U.S. centric because I know U.S. history better than anything. I do know some European history, but not as well as I know U.S. history. But the United States started going downhill in the mid, you know, 1800s, I guess you could say. In 1860 or so, we had the American Civil War. That would have never happened if America would have been a righteous people. Matter of fact, guess who was the vice president of the Confederacy? A guy named Benjamin Judah. And if you would have guessed he was one of the tribe, you would be guessing right. He was. It's funny how they always seem to get up there in positions of power. And from what I understand, he encouraged everybody to fight against the North. And they were not fighting for... Everybody tells you, oh, it's slavery, slavery. No, it had nothing to do with slavery. It was all about states' rights. And the North wanted a strong federal government. And the South is like, no, we want to be able to determine what our laws are and what we do. And after all, who do you think sold the slaves to the South? Wall Street was originally a slave area. Ships would come in from New York and they would sell the slaves on Wall Street and then ship them down South. Yeah, same crew then as today. You know, we had World War I. We had World War II. And then what happened in the 50s? Oh, Playboy magazine. And what about the 60s? Uh, well, I don't know exactly when uh, Hustler and all those kind of filth came out, but uh, I'm guessing probably 60s or at, by definitely by the 70s. And what is the internet? The two most popular things on the internet, porn and gambling. Those are the two most viewed things on the internet. What does that tell you? You know, the uh, filth on the television. Oh, and the television started in the 50s. I remember dad spending a small fortune on a console television, a Zenith. Really nice television, but unfortunately it was filth. If I remember correctly, it was about $500. You could have bought a, a fairly decent used car for that kind of money back, back then. I mean, you know, uh, I could have bought a, a I remember a, buying a, Burger King Whopper, shake and a fries for 65 cents. A brand new Volkswagen was about $2,000, a little bit less. I think about $1,800, you know. So 500 bucks would have bought a, you know, candy bars were a nickel. I think a six pack of beer was uh, about 69 cents or something like that. I mean, I remember some of these prices. Why? Because I used to go with mom to the store because mom didn't trust me to stay home alone because I was a troublemaking kid and I always got in trouble and did things I shouldn't have been doing. So mom would drag me along to the store 
And I remember prices. I remember getting five loaves of white bread for a dollar. 20 cents. I went to a grocery yesterday and bought a loaf of bread. Of course, you know, whole wheat type bread is not like buying white bread. I mean, whole wheat bread costs a lot more. But it was $6 for a pound and a half loaf of bread. Six dollars used to be 20 cents. Goes to show you just how much they've uh, diluted the money supply and ruined it. You know, if we follow the Bible, we would have gold and silver for coins, which we used to have. Up until 1933, we had gold coins in this country. That was legal tender. And then until 1964, after they assassinated our president, Kennedy, we had silver coins. One of the first things they did after Kennedy was dead was got rid of the uh, silver coins. That's when, back when I could have taken a silver dime, gone to 7-Eleven and bought two candy bars for a nickel, uh, which I did many times, many times. I remember that stuff. Wish I'd have not bought the candy bars and kept the silver coins, but uh, I digress. America and Europe, I've been to Europe, it was a long time ago, but mid-70s. It's been a long time since Europe and America has had the Lord's righteousness as a nation. A long time ago and now that's why the children of the devil are doing everything they can to get lead us into sin so that the Lord will destroy us abortion on demand 1973 about 10 years earlier I think 63 or 64 they came out with what was called the pill. They don't even need to call it birth control. They just called it the pill. So girls could play around with their boyfriends and not have to worry about having a child. Of course, it wasn't 100% effective, but uh, it was close from what I understand. But uh, there were consequences. You know, it's just America has, and Europe, has gone down the toilet. Public schools. They took uh, prayer and Bible reading out of school in the early 60s. Around 64, around the time they killed Kennedy. And we, I remember first grade, we had it. Prayer and Bible reading in Jesus' name. Boy, that was a long time ago. Now, we have uh, Lord of the Rings by Tolkien and uh, Harry Potter as, you know, required reading. Where they, you know, teach evolution and everything else. You know, there's a reason why they want to lead this nation into sin. God, they know full well that, you know, the fallen angels and their children know full well. God will absolutely allow the destruction of this, of this nation by the evil ones. God will allow it, absolutely. And it all started in the pulpits. People like Billy Goat Graham. One of their favorite tricks is when you're starting to get a ministry, you teach a lot of truth. Absolutely teach a lot of truth. And then once you've gained people's confidence, then you slip in the lie. You know, look at it, rat poison. 
Isn't rat poison like 90-something percent perfectly good food? It's only, what, 1, 2, 3 percent poison? You know, 97 percent good food. It's only got a little bit of poison. And that's what Billy Graham did. They slipped in all the poison. Oh, yes, the pre-trib rapture. Dispensational theology. Oh, don't read that Bible verse. That's for the you-know-whos. That doesn't apply to us. We're the church. Oh, really? I thought the whole Bible was for the church. Uh, you know, and then they teach the you-know-whos are God's chosen people. You know, the ones that Christ called the children of the devil. Well, obviously not all of them, but uh, there are those that claim to be, but are not. Revelation 2.9, anybody? But enough with that. That's the bad news. You ever had somebody say, well, I got good news and I got bad news. What do you want first? Personally, I always tell them, give me the bad news first. Well, that's what I did. I gave you the bad news. Let's take a look at the, the good news. Do you know that's what the word gospel basically means? Good news? Yeah. What does Webster, Noah Webster, his 1828 dictionary say about gospel? Noun. It's from the Latin word evangelium. That's where you get the word evangelism from. I don't know if you've ever heard of James White. Dr. James White. His whole ministry is bashing the King James Bible. Yes, indeed. He'll, he'll debate anybody. He's a good debater. Even though he lies through his teeth, he sounds really... Uh, he should have been a snake oil salesman, you know, sell snow to Eskimos, right? But uh, he'll, uh, he'll tell you, yeah, well, you know, it doesn't matter... Uh, what Bible you use, they all say the same thing. Well, one Bible says, uh, Thou hast increased the joy. And then another Bible says, Thou hast not increased the joy. Same verse. So which is it? Did it increase the joy or not increase the joy? Oh, but they all say the same thing, right? They all say the same thing. And then he'll say, well, you know, the King James Bible, is a, it's an okay translation, but it's got a bunch of errors. But you know what? We know where the errors are, so we can correct them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, James White thinks he knows better than the 50-something scholars and believers that put together the King James Bible. And he used the Greek manuscripts, not the corrupted Vatican manuscripts from the Pope, you know, those wonderful people that burned Christians at the stake for daring to have a Bible? Yeah, he wants to use their manuscripts that are missing entire books of the Bible. Do you know the, the entire book of Revelation is not in the, the, the Vatican's manuscripts? Really? It's not. They have to go to the, the Greek church manuscripts to get the, uh, the book of Revelation to put it in the Catholic Bible. Yeah. And we're supposed to trust people like James White. I've been praying for judgment upon him, but so far the Lord has not answered my prayer. It wouldn't bother me in a bit if he had a stroke. Could never talk again, but uh, yeah. Gospel, noun, Latin, evangelium, a good or joyful message. A good message. The history of the birth, life, actions, death, resurrection ascension and doctrines of jesus christ as a or a revelation of the grace of god to follow man through a mediator including the character actions and doctrines of christ and the whole scheme of salvation i guess you could use plan scheme has a negative connotation but uh nowadays but uh yeah, probably not in his day and the whole scheme or plan 
of salvation as revealed by Christ and his apostles, the gospel is said to have been preached to Abraham by the promise in Galatians 3.8, in thee shall all nations be blessed. It is called the gospel of God, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. It is called the gospel of Christ, Romans 1.16. It is called the gospel of salvation, Ephesians 1.13. God's word, divinity, theology, any general doctrine. Gospel, verb, transitive, to instruct in the gospel or to fill with sentiments of religion. Of course, James White will say that, uh, uh, like the word Lucifer in Isaiah 14, he'll say, oh, well, that word doesn't belong in the Bible because it's Latin. Latin words don't belong in English. Well, the word gospel comes from Latin too. So I guess we should just throw away the word gospel, shouldn't we, Mr. Dr. James White, you, you heretic? So let's take a look at righteousness. Now, one of the good things about the King James Bible, and it doesn't work with all the other versions that I know of. Uh, be honest, I have not looked into how this works with the Geneva Bible, so I'm not sure. But I know the modern Bibles, this thing I'm going to show you, does not work. Usually, the first time a word or a phrase appears in the Bible, in the context that it's used, explains the tone or usage for the entire rest of the Bible. So let's go to Genesis chapter 15, righteousness. First time that it's used in the Bible. Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. And what's a shield? Protection, right? Against the fiery darts of the, of the evil one. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's take a look at shield real quick. Ephesians chapter 6. Oh, yeah. If Ephesus, a city in Greece, Paul writing, you know, the, that Paul, that horrible guy, Paul, that they say uh, wasn't a real apostle. They say, oh, he was a fake apostle. Well, he might be a fake apostle of uh, their apostles, which is the devil's apostles. But uh, I believe Christ picked Paul. Ephesians 6, verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Woo woo! And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield, the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Mm. And take the helmet, helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And they want to tell you that Paul was a false apostle here. The breastplate of righteousness. What does a breastplate cover? Your heart, your lungs, your, your, the most important parts, some of the most important parts of your body. Of course, your head is too, but that's what the helmet's for. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the shield of faith, where you're able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Let's go back to Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is as Eliezer of Damascus. 
And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, no children. I mean, let's face it. Abram is not a tree with fruit hanging down, you know. You know, he's not an apple tree. And you cut open the apple and there's a bunch of seeds, right? No. 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 Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, no children. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this shall not be thine heir. Nope, this Eliezer, your, your servant, that's not going to be your heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. See, the Lord's going to give him a son. That's going to be his heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Now, if you live in a city, there's not very many stars. But I'll tell you what, you go out in the middle of the desert where there's no nothing, and you look up in the sky, there's literally what appears to be millions of stars. And the Lord said, Look toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Just like the stars in heaven, that's what your children are going to be like for numbers. Verse 6, And he, Abram, and he believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Believing the Lord is counted as righteousness. You know, that's the thing. Do you believe the Bible? When it says to use gold and silver for your money, a just weight and a just measurement? Or do you believe, oh, I can give this guy a short weight and charge him extra. That's not that's not righteousness. That's deceit and deception. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him for righteousness. Ah, so that's what righteousness is. Believing the Lord. In the book of Leviticus, 19 and verse 15, now Leviticus was the training book for the Levitical priesthood, the tribe of Levi, the priests. They were to instruct people on God's law, his ways. We read, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. You know, just because somebody's uh, poor and they're your friend, or uh, just because somebody's got a lot of money or whatever, don't let that pervert your judgment when you're judging between two people. Sadly, today, that's what it's all about. I doubt if, I, I doubt, I wonder if even 1% of the judges in our country are even judge in righteousness. In Deuteronomy 6.25, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. See, if you believe, you will do. It's just that simple. You know, if the Lord says, oh, you know, uh, 
Every year I'd like you, you know, I want you to do a Passover. You know, if the people believed, they would do it. They would take the lamb and slay it and put the door, you know, the blood on the doorposts like they did in Egypt. But if they don't believe, well, like the Egyptians, they were, uh, well, they didn't believe and they didn't do it and they were slaughtered. The firstborn anyways. So faith and righteousness goes hand in hand. Well, with obedience. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 1. Now Israel had left Egypt, and now they're going into the promised land. And God said, do what I tell you to do. Well, that's, uh, we don't do that, do we? No. Verse 1, Deuteronomy 9, 1. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Now remember, God let the Canaanites uh, build these cities. They planted all these fruit trees, gardens with vegetables and herbs, you know. They did all the work. And now the Lord's saying, go in. Get rid of these bunch of devils. Verse 2. A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims. Who are the Anakims? They were giants. You know, just like Genesis 6, the flood, after the flood. A people great and tall. Yeah, and then you got uh, your modern preachers, they'll say, oh, well, you know, they were, these giants, they were just giants to do evil. They didn't look any different than the other people. Well, it tells you they were tall. I mean, duh. You know, that's why I don't, that's why I don't trust uh, tr preachers anymore. A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? Yeah, can you stand before the children of the giants to fight? Pretty hard, unless you got the Lord by your side. Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee, as a consuming fire, he shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. Speak not thou in thine heart. After that, the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness... The Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. Nope, it's not your righteousness, not your fleshly righteousness, why the Lord is doing this. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. That's why. Not they didn't do it, the Lord didn't do it because of Israel's righteousness. The Lord was going to get rid of them for their wickedness. These people were bad news, people. Bad news. Matter of fact, the word cannibal is a contraction of the words Canaan and Baal. B-A-A-L. Uh, it's a generic word for Lord. And it became so associated with Satanism, the Lord said, don't call me that anymore. And then Canaan, you know, the Canaanites, Genesis 6, they were the tribes the Lord said to get rid of. And they were cannibals. Canaan and Baal. Canaan Baal. No, not Burt Reynolds and the Cannibal Run. No. 
They were doing human sacrifices and devouring their victims. So, but for the right of, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Verse 5. Not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, now remember, Abram had his name changed to Abraham, which means father of many nations. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word, the promise, which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel, which means a uh, prince with God or ruler with God. Verse 6. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this, this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until ye came unto this place. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Sound familiar? Also in Horeb, ye provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. Sound familiar? You know, the Lord is gracious, slow to anger, and of great mercy. But there reaches a point in time where he says, enough is enough. I've had it. And I honestly, my opinion, my opinion, it's getting close where God's had enough. God's had a belly full. In Job 29, verse 12, because I delivered the poor that cried and the fatherless and him that had none to help him, the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. Think about the white robes of Christ in Revelation. Think about that. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. I was eyes to the blind and feet was I to the lame. The only righteousness there is, is that it, the Lord. That's it. Let's take a look at some Psalms. 7 verse 8. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to mine integrity that is in me. Verse 17. I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. And will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Psalms 9 8. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Psalms 11 7. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Let's take a look at the 23rd Psalms, one of the most famous verses in all the Bible. Boy, when I was a volunteer at the Veterans Cemetery, uh, this was a very, very requested chapter to be read at the interning 
the service member at the VA cemetery. Psalms 23, verse 1. A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Aren't we called sheep in the New Testament? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I give my life for the sheep. Oh, yeah. Verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Think about the marriage supper of the Lamb, people. Think about that. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Psalms 24, 5, He shall receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Righteousness comes from the Lord, not from us. Here's some interesting verses. Isaiah 41.10 Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 42.6 I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Isaiah 51. Here's an interesting uh, verse. Hearken to me. Listen. Hearken to me. Ye that follow after righteousness. Ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock. Whence ye are hewn. And what, is, what does the Bible say? What does Paul say? Paul says the rock was Christ. Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Here's a very popular verse, Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And it's obviously not talking about your flesh, your soul and spirit. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. And whose tongue is that? Satan, the devil, the accuser. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness, their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. See, our righteousness is of the Lord, period. There's just no other way around it. Here's an interesting verse, Isaiah 59, verse 15. Yea, truth faileth, but he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. See, there is no judgment 
in the criminal courts anymore. Uh, matter of fact, there was a someone with some dark skin in New York City, and he kicked an elderly Asian woman to the ground. And we find out he was on probation, or he was either on probation or on parole. He was out of prison for what? For killing his mother with a knife. I mean, can you imagine that? You kill your mother with a knife and you're walking the streets. And then what do they blame? They blame uh, uh, the guns. Yeah, they blame the guns. Yeah, it's the guns' fault. Well, actually, it was the knife's fault. Yeah. Didn't you know that knife got itself out of the kitchen and went right into the heart of his mother, I guess? So, uh, yeah. And he was trying to pull it out of his mother's chest when, uh, yeah, something like that. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. What's an intercessor? Somebody that stands between you and the judge. Verse 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Cloak is like a cape. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands, he will repay recompense. Isaiah 59 ties right into Ephesians 6 and verse 14. Stand therefore, having your girt, loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ties right into it, doesn't it? And yet there's many out there that will tell you, oh, Paul was a false apostle. How the hell with those people. Isaiah 61.10 I will rejoice, uh, greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. Remember those white robes everybody's given that are washed in the blood of Christ? We'll cover that in Revelation when we get there. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth, adorneth herself with her jewels. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention something, but uh, why is it called righteousness? Why is it called righteousness? Uh, the first five letters are right, R-I-G-H-T. Is that opposed to being right or correct? As opposed to being wrong? You know, right and wrong? Uh, or does it have reference to the right and the left? Hmm. So does righteousness have reference to being right and wrong or the right hand and the left hand or the right and the left uh well what does the bible say about right and left matthew 25 verse 31 when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him now you know if there's holy angels there has to be unholy angels 
Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, righteousness, right? And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Huh. So the sheep go to one place, righteous, right, right hand, righteous. But the goats go on the left side. They go to the other place where they'll never have to worry about wearing a sweater because they're cold. Uh, isn't it funny that uh, communists and socialists, they always call themselves the left. But you hear on the media, oh, it's those right-wingers. They're the trouble. They're the problem. Well, yeah, we're the problem to the left-wingers. You know, there's a reason why they, uh, you know, the Church of Satan picks the goat and Baphomet as their symbol. They know who they are. They know what they are. So it was righteousness. Is it right and wrong or is it right hand, left hand? I don't know. Righteousness means right hand, but if it does, I want to be a sheep and not a goat. And there are sheep that act like goats, but, and there are goats that act like sheep. But if you're born a sheep, you're, you're a sheep. And if you're born a goat, you're a goat. And sheep, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry, goats don't become sheep. It just don't happen. So, all right, let's take a look. Righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's his name. Jeremiah 33, 16. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name, this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And who's the she? Jerusalem. Huh. You know, people, uh, well, women, maybe not the girls today, but uh, when I was kind of growing up and stuff, women would love to read those Harlequin love novels. And, uh, you know, if you want to read a love novel, read the book of Hosea. I mean, this is a, this is a love story between the Lord and his people. Absolutely. Let's go to Hosea chapter 2. And I could read the whole thing, but I'm going to start in verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her, Israel, and I will give her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Who came out of the land of Egypt? Israel. Verse 16. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai, and shalt call me no more Baalai. B-A-A-L with an I on the end. You know that generic word for Baal, Baal, that means uh, Lord? Verse 17, For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. Hmm. Who is not to be remembered by their name? Israel! 
Does Israel today remember? Do they not remember their name? No. And they shall no more be remembered by their name. Huh. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Betroth means, uh, has reference to marriage. It's a promise to marriage. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness. I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. Uh, Jezreel has reference to, if memory serves me correctly, a battle where the wicked are destroyed. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say unto them which were not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. Reference that to Jeremiah 3.8, where God divorced Israel. You're not my people. I divorced you. To Jeremiah 31, 31, where the Lord says he would make a new, not a renewed, a new covenant with the house of Judah and with the house of Israel. Here is something for today. Zephaniah, Z-E-P-H-A-N-I-A-H. I always get Zephaniah and Zechariah mixed up. I don't know why, but I do. Chapter 2, verse 1. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation, not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass, as the chaff. Now remember, chaff is uh, what uh, the stuff that you can't eat comes from the plants, and you can't eat it, so it's only good for burning. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as a chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord. Before the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Ooh. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. All right, now we're going to look at Zechariah. Z-E-C-H-A-R-I-A-H. 8, 8. And I will bring them, who? Israel. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. So let's take a look at Malachi chapter 3. Hmm. Malachi 3, verse 1. You know, think about this with John the Baptist in Christ. I mean, this is a messianic prophecy right here. Behold, I will send my messenger, John the Baptist, right? And he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek 
shall suddenly come to his temple. Isn't that what Christ did? He came to the temple. And he took a whip of cords and scourged and beat the money changers out of the temple. Oh, if only we had that today. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Isn't that what Christ did, the new covenant? Yes. Whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. You know, when you had uh, dirty laundry, what do you do? You take fuller's soap to clean it, right? And what is this about a refiner's fire? Well, let's say you had a steel making business. You take iron ore and you you put it in a, a container, metal container, and you you put a fire under it. And the iron is heavy, and it sinks to the bottom, and all the other stuff on top that they call slag, you scrape it off the top. Sort of like, uh, ladies, when you, you're you cooking, and uh, you know, you're know you making a soup or something, and all the gunk is on the top, the, all the fat floats, right? And you don't want that stuff in your food, so you skim it off. Well, that's what a... They call it a refinery. And then they take the iron and they mix it with uh, carbon. And it turns into steel. Which is supposedly ten times stronger than iron. For he is like a refiner's fire. See, God wants to refine us. He wants all the garbage out of our lives. He wants us to be pure. It's not all those impurities. For he, the Lord, is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He wants to cleanse us. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Wow. Wow. In Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist is baptizing people in the River Jordan, and Jesus comes to him. And Jesus says, baptize me, John. Well, that's the Bob translation. And John says, Lord, I have need to be baptized of you, and comest thou to me? And in Matthew 3.15, and Jesus answering said unto him, suffer, or allow, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all all righteousness. Then he, John, suffered him. In Matthew 5, 6, Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And John, Matthew 5, 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20. Jesus said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Who are the Pharisees? The Jays. Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. John 16, 8. And when he is come, who? When who is come? Well, to answer that question, let's go back to John 16 and verse 7. Jesus speaking, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. 
He's getting ready to be crucified. For if I go not away, the Comforter, the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. In the book of Romans 1 and verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And let's read Romans 3.22. You know, the people that don't like Paul. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Hmm. In Romans 4, 3, we read this in Genesis. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. You know why all these Hebrew roots, sacred name people, uh, messianics, why they hate Paul? It can be summed up in one sentence. Romans 5.21 That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace, grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. See, these people, uh, they want to do their righteousness by their own hands. Oh, we keep the Sabbath. We do circumcision. And we do this and we do that. And we don't eat pork. And that's what makes us righteous. Uh, I don't think so. So... And here we go, Romans 10, 3 and 4. Romans 10, uh, verse 3 and verse 4. Uh, this is uh, another thing why they hate Paul. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Remember, Jesus said that uh, except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, that you wouldn't make it. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's not that hard. It's not that hard to figure out. You want to do faith or you want to have law? And then if you break the law once, well, you're in trouble. How about Philippi? Philippians 3 9. Paul again. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Ah, there we go. Second Timothy 2.22 Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, 
charity. And that word charity, sometimes they uh, translated that word charity sometimes as love. I mean, if you have love, you'll have charity. And if you have charity, you have love. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Hmm. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Hmm. Boy, I tell you what, you could read Hebrews 11. This is the faith chapter. Uh, remember uh, Noah Webster said that uh, righteousness and faith are almost interchangeable words. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet uh, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Oh, yeah. All right, let's take a look at James 2.23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Boy, how would you like to be called God's friend? Wow. 1 Peter 3, 4, 14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Somebody sent a memo to the Baptist church, you know, the pre-trib rapture people. Oh, yeah. All right, let's get ready to close this out. Revelation 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen! Alleluia! And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Who's the wife? The church. Is the church ready now? No, she's not even close. The church is not ready now. But I'll tell you what, when they go through this period of having to give up everything for the Lord, including their lives, then she'll be ready. But until then, uh-uh. Can you imagine? These people don't even have faith that the Lord can keep them healthy, that they run to a doctor to get a, the current medical treatment that, uh, you know, they need a uh, passport for, yeah, 
Yeah. Is that really trusting in the Lord? The great physician? I mean, think about it. No, my pastor told me to go and get the, uh, you know what, in the arm. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Hmm, let's read something real quick. All right, let's go to Revelation 7, verse 12. And um, we're getting ready to close this out. Verse 12, 7, 12, Revelation 7, 12. Saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? You know, who are these that are dressed in these white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. You know, it's like, hey, what are you asking me for? You know the answer. Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So you better have a robe washed in the blood of the Lamb, a white robe washed in the blood of the Lamb, if you want to make it to the marriage supper. Very important. Let's go back to Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed, clothed, in fine linen, clean and white, for the white, uh, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Do you get it? The blood of the Lamb. Your faith is your righteousness. We're going to be clothed with righteousness because of the blood of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And that people, I hope you learned something. I know I always seem to learn something every time I do a Bible study. Um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.